Good evening and bon année. Today is the second day of January 2016 and we continue with our explorations in Savitri with our beloved Alokbai. We are in book two, the book of the traveler of the worlds, <coughs> canto three, the glory and the fall of life. As always, I read a letter or two from Sri Aurobindo. 1938, so we have jumped from 36 to 38. I have not been able to make any headway with Savitri. Owing to lack of time, and also to an appalled perception of this disgraceful imperfection of all the sections after the first two. But I have tackled them again, as I think I wrote to you, and have pulled up the third section to a higher consistency of level. The worlds have fallen into a state of manuscript chaos. Corrections upon corrections, additions upon additions, rearrangements on rearrangements, out of which perhaps some cosmic beauty will emerge. We ended with the line, power laid its head upon the breasts of bliss. This next 15 lines or so want to take a little time with you because we are aware that Sri Aurobindo never used a superfluous word. There were summit glories inconceivable, autonomies of wisdoms still self-rule, and high dependencies of her virgin son, illumined theocracies of the seeing soul, throned in the power of the transcendence ray, a vision of grandeurs, a dream of magnitudes, in sunbright kingdoms moved with regal gait, assemblies, <coughs> crowded senates of the gods, life's puissances reigned on seats of marble will, high dominations and autocracies and laurel strengths and armed imperative mights. All objects there were great and beautiful. All beings wore a royal stamp of power. Now, it's, one could spend an entire hour just on these lines. But I want to give you the definitions of some of the words. Because Ashwapati is seeing a plane here where all kinds of government are working in harmony. Autonomies are groups having immunity from arbitrary exercise of authority. Dependencies are immunities from arbitrary exercise of authority and political independence. Theocracies, political units governed by a deity or by officials thought to be divinely guided. Assemblies, groups of persons gathered together for a common purpose. Senates, Assemblies possessing high legislative powers. Dominations, those wielding the power to control. Autocracies, political systems governed by a single individual. Oligarchies, political <coughs> systems governed by a few people. And all these governances we see on this plane. Yes. What we see here is a shadowy reflection and distortion of what 
exist in the beyond. In the life heavens, in their highest peaks, they are in perfect harmony with each other. That yes. is the main difference. Yes. And here we see separate groups striving for power. Their power is natural and there is none who is weak. That's what we have read. So there is not this craving, this ambition, this striving for something, but it's naturally present. So this feeling that there are some who are lower and some higher doesn't exist in spite of the fact that there are autonomies and uh, you know oligarchies yes. and theocracy. That's the beauty of this plane. We have a lot of description of this plane, this primarily a plane of the highest vital gods. Uh, which are very different from the heavens of the mind. In the heavens of the mind, we will see thought, idea, vision, intuition, inspiration. All the gods there carry that around them. They are more meditative, more quiet, and yet they see through large spaces of time. In the vital heavens, the highest heavens, of course, not the intermediate heavens, we have all these gods who have power. This is a manifestation of power because life is about that. And along with that, they have beauty, they have bliss, some joy, some drop of that bliss inconceivable enters this plane. They have love. And we have these things in the highest heavens of the vital. So life has uh, created this on its peaks. And it wants something of that to enter here and manifest here. But we have read that she has stabled her dreams in matter's courts. This is the problem. It has to go through a process of long purification. One may wonder why is Sri revealing all this to her, uh, us? What is the relevance to our everyday life? Yes. One, it's good to remind ourselves again and again that we are neither the last nor the final in this chain of creation. There is a vast cosmic chain where we are somewhere in between. And second, to remind ourselves that, well, there are planes waiting to manifest themselves upon earth. And there have been periods of time when some of these planes have manifested upon earth. Mother speaks about it that there have been civilizations in the past where something of the beyond did manifest, but they were momentary. And then she says that the last one in which some of these things manifested was the Vedic civilizations. When they had the vision of the supermental yes. but could not... Yes, Bring and and something of that power and glory, yeah. there were beings who were born embodying this power and glory. So they lived with a larger consciousness and, uh, you know, this kind of wearing a royal stamp of power. Uh, this was felt there, or love, which would, you know, be carried to its extreme. And what these beings are, a, a lot of description of these beings exist typically in the Puranic literature of India. So those who are familiar with the literature will find uh, so much familiarity. You know, as we read through, it's very interesting. For instance, you read a word, very, very you know, autonomies. Did we read that word? Yes. Uh, yes, autonomies. Now we are here about autonomy, but we, you know, autonomies. Autonomies. <laughs> yes. Where each one was a power absolute in his own right. Mm-hmm. And that is something very interesting. He is not governed by anyone. So we have these great gods where each one is has the full freedom and the authority and the power upon the world. Exactly. And another one who also has the complete freedom and power over the world. And what happens when some of these beings very rarely may come into clash. Though in the highest supramental they are all in perfect harmony in the integral Godhead. But in the over mind, sometimes, though rarely, even these greatest autonomies may be at cross with each other. So, and, and the divine has to resolve it. <laughs> Not an easy task. So it's good to remember and because this dream exists in the human heart and very imperfectly we try to translate it. Look, comes this word oligarchy. They are sad, the oligarchies of natural law. So each, there were few who governed the many. And each of them represented a law, the God of justice, the God of kindness, the God of strength, the God of beauty. Each has its own law. Beauty demands 
another kind of perfection and strength a very different kind of perfection so they were oligarchies each representing an aspect or an attribute and the rest of the beings of this world were governed by them and um, the mother seems to have preferred this actually she says in the agenda that what types of government she was not very fond of democracy that's very no, sure no and shirobindo was also not very fond of uh, democracy though he said it's a more modern idea and it's necessary that we have to pass through it and communism yes. is it had to be tried had to be tried ultimately it is a divine communism or a divine socialism which is the ultimate possibility uh, but meanwhile ideal is of course if it's a theocracy where there is a divinely divine being who actually governs but it's not easy you can't have divine beings you know made to order so when mother was uh, is here of course in her uh, in another way but when physically embodied to everybody's vision then whatever she said was the final word so when someone came and he was very distraught because modern idea of democracy and he questioned the mother this seems to be like a dictatorship so people who were around mp pandit speaks about it people who were around they were bit you know not comfortable that you know somebody is using the word dictator for the mother but mother smiled and she replied well a benevolent dictatorship if you like because it was she is the absolute authority because she has the absolute wisdom then she reveals in the agenda that if such a divine being is not there then what should be done she says there should be a group of 4 to 8 wise men who have risen to wisdom who would govern the rest now what will be the sign of these wise men one sign he gives is that their needs are very few they don't really need anything in you know they are free free from the taint of desire and the other of course he says that the ego that must go and they would be very supple wide open to you know they are very compassionate she describes all this in the agenda that what kind of governance should be there eventually doesn't sri arbindo speak of 12 men yes he speaks of that and of course we know that 12 apostles of christ yes <laughs> so so this um, this sense of hierarchy existed at some point of time yes. but uh, yeah. understandably the modern mind doesn't accept it it's the rule of reason and reason cannot look deeper beyond the surfaces so for reason well all human beings are equal because they look equal to start with it's one species genus and it doesn't you know believe in further classifying except when there is a morbid condition and again the moment it classifies it makes an error it goes into racism so it's a very dangerous uh, yes yeah it there there been periods when humanity has tried to stratify and classify but again it's misused because human beings are not ready and they are not pure enough but in the origin if we take the original plan either there is an autocracy of the divine being or there is an oligarchy this is the truth of the higher worlds which one day it will manifest and that he describes that again who what kind of beings these are now it's very interesting he uses the word proud violent heads served one calm monarch brow violent gods can be violent and in one of the essays superman shurbindo says that the gods can be violent but their violence is always tempered with wisdom and compassion even in their violence there is calm there is wisdom and there is compassion unlike the asuric violence which is driven by the ego which is only for self glorification self aggrandizement the violence of the gods like shiva the extremely violent god even vishnu at times he can be pretty violent he wakes up from the sleep and has to slay two demons that's violent enough <laughs> but it's always tempered with compassion and wisdom and calm it's not with anger and agitation so here this word violent because these are the gods very high gods all the souls postures donned divinity so every action every feelings that emanated emerged from the soul was divine 
then again there's there met the ardent mutual intimacy of mastery is joy and the joy of servitude so the difference again between a titanic kind of monarchy or dictatorship and a divine kind of benevolent dictatorship is this that the titan wants to crush people under his weight he doesn't feel satisfied unless there are people who will uh, salute him and admit him and acknowledge him as the highest but this monarchy is very different this uh, regality and royalty and autocracy is a very different kind here the ruler serves those who are ruled so for him and shubindu describes this beautifully in arya uh, he describes what the aryan meant because something of this kind was attempted in the way past in the indian civilizations and the records are still there it has been practiced elsewhere also you know the epics of gilgamesh for instance there have been very noble kings and uh, in the western context uh, king arthur and many others you know solomon there have been but in india there is a whole lineage of such kings who had a very subtle mind and uh, you know they really represented something of the divine being but what kind of kingliness is this of mastery is joy and the joy of servitude imposed by love on love's heart that obeys and loves body held beneath a rapturous yoke so the moving power behind everything was love and those who were obeying they were not obeying out of you know a sense of being servile or being inferior or you know i have no choice but they always felt that by such obedience there was an upliftment it was an act of love it was an act of uh, you know joy and this is what um, opens door to something else also you know very often people use the word mother's work mother's work or uh, an indication this is how i have understood that an indication that we are really doing the work in the spirit of it being the mother's work is that we feel joy and love if these two are missing if there is oh my god it's a mechanical drudgery i have to get up go to the nursing home or i have to oh, go and do work in the dining room it's not mother's work anymore we may use the word that yes yes i am offering but somewhere i have got disconnected but the moment there is joy of service to the divine and the love that accompanies it then it's a sign that we are touching base with the soul yes, yes. so here we have this wonderfully that everything was an act of love all was a game of meeting kinglinesses and then he, these are marvelous lines very often people say all that is all right but why should we worship why should we obey why surrender super mind is there i can do it on my own well if one wants to try it try it it's like saying that i'll pull the sun's energy and uh, burn my body <laughs> and become supramentalized even this sun is difficult enough to take what to speak of supramental sun so there is a key and the beings of this world knew this for worship lifts the worshippers bowed strength this is the difference when people worship the titan he keeps the person always under his toe or his thumb he he will never allow the worshipper to be lifted up and come up to his level because then his game is over <laughs> he is always afraid yeah. but what do the gods do they lean down lift the worshipper and embrace him with their heart this is the difference so worship lifts the worshipers bowed strength close to the god's pride and bliss his soul adores the ruler there is one with all heroes so how the mother would say i am with you when you sink i don't stand on the shore i go down with you that's why she use the word benevolent dictator yes the ruler there is one with all he rules to him who serves with a free equal heart obedience is his princely training's school his nobility's coronet and privilege his faith is a high nature's idiom his service a spiritual sovereignty this one of the first things one gets trained in the ashram context obedience now 
I remember uh, Rishabh Chand's story. When he came, he was given the task of uh, furniture service. Right. Very happy. <clears throat> and the first job he gets is that kill the bugs inside the cot. <laughs> He and can't he's, kill. He's a giant. He is a giant. He can't kill. And killing was pretty horrendous to pour hot water and they will come out and kill with a stone. So he wrote to Sri that mother doesn't know I am a giant. And Sri wrote one liner that whatever work the mother gives you, do it with a spirit of surrender. It is the best for your progress. That's it. Yeah. Ravindraji total vegetarian, was given the task of egg service. So it literally handled. And those days, vegetarians, they wouldn't even touch egg. Touching egg was like as bad as sin. <laughs> it's a sin. <laughs> obedience. But this obedience lifts us. It widens, ennobles, yes. purifies, refines. So many people were given interesting works here in the ashram context. So Shubindu says it's a princely training school. If we can't even obey something which the divine has given us, then our nature will become unruly. We'll obey only the ego. So <laughs> there are works given uh, conditions in which you know people and what an obedience it is. I mean amazing stories in the ashram context. Somebody who apparently had done nothing wrong to his understanding and the mother asked him to leave the ashram and go. So he goes to Nalida and says, but I have not done anything wrong. Nalida gave a reply, well, if the mother tells you to go, just obey her. It is a grace. Yes. And then he says, yes, I didn't think it like that. I was living in that web of the mind. And he goes. After a few years, he says, that was your advice which saved me. And now I fully understand why she asked me to go. So, obedience is so important. Of course, it's to the divine. It's in a certain context. So, he's speaking about those planes. Obedience is very dangerous if there is Hitler sitting on top of you. <laughs> then there is a place for revolt. But these are not the worlds of revolt. These are worlds of harmony and light yes. and beauty. His nobilities coronate and privilege. Obedience becomes a crown. Coronate. It's like a small crown and privilege. It's a privilege to obey the divine. There was a person in the dining room carrying a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of weight on his uh, shoulders and somebody laughingly remarked, So, Kuli, Kuli, you know, people who lift weight. And he said, Yes, Her Kuli. Her Kuli. And also Hercules. <laughs> it's a pun on the word. That's not, not an ordinary thing. Today I was reading a, a past All India magazine, one of the places Shobindu says, a man doing manual labor in obedience to the divine, surrendered to the divine, his, his work is far superior to somebody who is doing mental culture and intellectual work simply for the aggrandization of the ego. So, you know, it's his coronet and privilege. It's a great privilege to be able to serve the divine. And, um, you know, one cannot imagine what one would have, one would never deserve it. And look at this, his faith is a high nature's idiom. What a usage of words, <laughs> idiom. I never <laughs> read yeah. idiom used with nature. Idiom <laughs> is a set of words which have a meaning. Uh, if you see the totality, you can't have a meaning of these words separately. You know, that's an idiom. So it's a phrase, it's a set of words which carries a meaning when you see it in its totality. But if you analyze individual words, you can't derive a meaning logically from it. So such a person's nature, you can't understand. And yet in its totality, it is lifted so close to the divine. His, his uh, faith is a high nature's idiom. His service is spiritual sovereignty. What a beautiful line this is. I mean, it's a great thing to be at the service of the divine. It's unimaginable, unparalleled. We see stories of Hanuman in Indian context. Service to the divine. And he becomes a demigod, Champaklal, 
whom the mother said, yeah. Champaklal, you have become a demigod. Yeah. And when he started, Shurabindo asked him, what do you want to do? He said, if you permit me, can I wash your dhotis? Shurabindo asked him, are you sure? So he didn't understand why Shurabindo asking him, are you sure? He said, yes, of course. So Shurabindo told him, people will tell you many things. And it's sometimes so jarring, almost like a pin pricking, when you read some places, Champaklal was a servant. I have read this. Very servant of the Lord, slave of the Lord is very different. <laughs> Better than being a slave of the ego. We are all servants. <laughs> servants of our desires, servants of our ego. Here is someone who was a slave of the Lord. Why servant? He was a slave. And Sri says that. Being a servant of the Lord is something. Being a slave is greater. Because servant still looks for the wages. But slave says, I am yours. Do with me what you want. And as Sri Aurobindo left his body, what he, a marvelous he, he embrace. kissed him again and again, again and again. So, what service and obedience, sovereignty, those who looked at Champaklal, they felt, my God, so much luminosity, so much of power exuding from his body. Yeah. At least that was my impression that how did people have darshan of Sri Aurobindo when just the darshan of Champaklal ji is so difficult? How, how has he traveled across the world? But what was that story when someone bowed to him? Yes. And he picked them up and took them to mother? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He, he would never allow. No. Of course, uh, with, with me and my wife, he made a very rare exception that I spontaneously bowed and he didn't oh. say anything. He, uh -huh. in fact, uh, touched the forehead into a different experience. So, of course, they are not bound by any hard rule. But in general... Uh, all of these beings who were really close to mother, they would never allow any such things which are, uh, you know, meant for the ego and its aggrandizement. This was their sign. It was so beautiful. So his service is spiritual sovereignty. There were realms where knowledge joined creative power. These are the highest heavens of the vital where it's united with the highest heavens of the mind. Where knowledge and creative power come together. And what happens then? In her high home and made her all his own. The grand illuminate seized her gleaming limbs. The grand illuminate. Yeah. It is the supramental sun shining through the overmind. Sending its rays. There, that's the place where life has its origin ultimately in the consciousness force. Yeah. And you know it's meeting in those realms and fill them with the passion of his ray till all her body was its transparent house so life becomes a house of the all wonderful yeah. and is transparent to the light moved by the light the divine light and all her soul a counterpart of his soul apotheosized transfigured by wisdom's touch divinized almost, yes. apotheosized, lifted up to its to own God. sovereign possibilities. Her days became a luminous sacrifice. And now he uses a word which again only Shobindu can use it, an immortal moth in happy and endless fire. Moth is classically immortalized in literature for its transient perishing nature. It is drawn to the light and the flame and it goes into it and dies. That's its final destiny. But here he uses the word immortal moth. It goes into the light and dances and plays in it. What happily, has it done? Happily, happily. happily. <laughs> An immortal moth in happy and endless fire. She burned life. She burned in his, the realms of knowledge. She burned she, she burned in his sweet, intolerable blaze, in the blaze of that fire which, which is found at the apex of the world. A captive life wedded her conqueror. So we see this description of the fire. In the Vedas, we have these two attributes of fire. And one is the light, which is the knowledge aspect. 
and the other is uh, warmth which is the power aspect so in fire we see a union of you know where he is describing yeah. a knowledge joint creative power so it is the description of the realm of agni the highest agni of course agni manifested different levels uh, even in the base of the yeah. spine we have agni which yeah. builds the matter there is an intermediate uh, agni but in its original home where power and knowledge they come together and fuse with each other so this is a description of the that world in his wide sky she built her world anew because she is transfigured she gave to minds calm peace the motors speed and even that's why in ordinary life or in spiritual life we need the life force we cannot discard even if somebody uh, has a great trouble with the vital you have no choice but either to tame it purify refine it without this life power one cannot really create anything one can practice a yoga of asceticism but even there the tapas is by the power of life so life energy is so much important for in ordinary life of course for any achievement but even for yogic achievement so it gives to the mind the motors speed otherwise is calm so it gives yes. gives that yes. power and speed to thinking a need to live what the soul saw it also imposes upon thought the need to express to manifest to live what it has seen in the vision so to living an impetus to know and see what a beautiful harmony is there his splendor grasped her her puja to him clung she crowned the idea a king in purple robes so again we see the word purple her body <laughs> and yes. purple robes of course is characteristically associated particularly in uh, biblical literature with royalty always always yes. and of course we have this sad story when christ <clears throat> body is crucified mocking at him they put a purple robe you know that was of course yes. uh, almost a mockery that look you are the king of the worlds but here is the robe but they were right because christ did rule over the world and continues to rule over human hearts so it's very interesting you know uh, but the purple because if if we see the combination of color it's it's coming together of red and blue that's how the purple color is created it's always in biblical literature associated with sovereignty and royalty and we see this again the other part of biblical literature put her magic serpent scepter in thought's grip so serpent the energy of evolution which is there with, with life scepter by which you rule so that evolutionary energy which is there in life life is programmed to evolve it it is programmed to create things so it has put in the hands of knowledge that okay you use this energy you do with me as you yeah. will here the serpent is representing the evolutionary energy not all serpents uh, um, you know are hostile um, there are serpents which represent evolution for instance vasuki around shiva's neck or sheshnag on which vishnu rests uh, the thousand hooded cobra even cobras quite a few of them represent evolutionary energy so sometimes these serpents particularly if they are white or golden or with a crown they represent the evolutionary power uh, even the serpent which bit which was found in the apple <laughs> mother spoke of that serpent that it is the evolutionary bug <laughs> evolutionary energy which bit so suddenly uh, adam and eve were in paradise life heaven we have read that yes. no shame yes. no guilt all is innocence and purity and force and love and joy but knowledge is missing yes so the evolutionary serpent comes and bites so suddenly they want to know <laughs> now the mind is at play <laughs> the moment you want to know and analyze you get a fall because then the mind begins to all kinds of weavings 
and then it has to go through the evolutionary curve of course that ultimately is which is necessary ultimately when you go beyond it then yes you get it but in the process you have lost that innocence yes. and purity of the garden of eden that is the evolutionary serpent made forms his inward visions rhythmic shapes and our acts the living body of his will a flaming thunder a creator flash his victor light rode on our deathless foes his centaurs mighty gallop bore the god now again we see you know images from uh, mythical literature centaur of course uh, they are beings of the mid world you can't really though classical dictionary would define them as monsters but they are actually neither good nor bad creatures it depends on who is riding and using them they are um, they have the head and uh, upper part of a human being and they have the torso and the limbs of a horse so um, they are described in mythical literature and of course in the life heavens they are found and they bore on them the gods so gods were riding these centaurs who could fly with wings and speed up and now we have a similar description of these animals connected to god life throned with mind a double majesty worlds were there of a happiness great and grave beautiful uh, combination normally we associate happiness with mirth and bubbliness oh he is a very happy guy but happiness can be very quiet i remember once uh, amal kiran asked this about i think it was about sehra or lalita i may be mistaken about the name but he asked that well you know she she is very grave so i'm not sure if everything is okay she said no she is beautifully in contact with her soul and she is a joy within herself so we have this tendency to associate happiness with externalization but happiness can be very deep and grave so here we have you know great and grave and action tinged with dream laughter with thought and passion there could wait for its desire until it heard the near approach of god that's because knowledge and power have come together yes in life heavens there is power in the mind heavens there is knowledge there are planes where they meet and that's where desire could wait till it heard the near approach of god sanctified by god you know it so many images can come you know in olden times if you see this now this institution is broken and mother has said marriage as an institution has gone it has outlived its purpose but way back when people loved each other they waited for marriage if you really look at it what does it mean what's wrong you love each other it's perfectly fine you can connect with any way but they waited for the whole thing to be sanctified by the presence and power of the divine in their life so they could love for long but yet they would wait till finally if at all they got married and then they could be together in a most intimate union otherwise no the desire could wait it's there but it would wait so it is another kind of tapasya of course the institution have lost its meaning outlived its purpose and as mother has said it has been misused and abused so it has been broken aside but this desire to wait till the approach of god and take that sanction of the divine i mean there are stories in the ashram context which are amazing one story that comes to my mind is of i won't name the person but the person very well known amazingly talented in diverse fields and there was a lady who loved him and uh, of course he knew that she loved him and he also had a very soft feelings for her uh, and they were both in the ashram as if okay fine they are friends and they love each other and meanwhile there is another lady who came into the picture who loved started loving this man and she had the courage to go and ask mother i want to get married to him and mother said yes 
when he came to know he didn't know what to do <laughs> he said yes mother they got married and well i must say lived happily ever after means all of them because it was very difficult for the other lady also for him also but look what obedience and service meant not 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 a second word yes mother and i have heard this story directly so you know it's my story is a little easier <laughs> okay yes that would be wonderful <laughs> mother said she wrote to me exactly this you must marry no doubt and no hesitation <laughs> <laughs> so i married <laughs> <laughs> but look at you know this uh, this is an approach to life which is so beautiful that desire waiting until it heard the near approach of god oh, that beautiful word yes. near approach of god oh. worlds were there of a childlike mirth and joy a carefree youthfulness of mind and heart found in the body a heavenly oh. instrument it lit an orient hello round desire and freed the deified deified animal in the limbs to divine gambols of love and beauty and bliss so now we have so many images of all these gods in indian mythology are always riding over an animal so it's a state of consciousness where we are not slave of desires we are masters we are not driven by it but it can be used but in a state of purity it's a very high state we can't even i mean we have read about it previously also and when shubhind was asked about it he said yes there is a truth but i am not inclined to disclose it because obviously everybody will believe i am pure enough to satisfy my desire <laughs> but it doesn't work like that so there is a state in which the animal see look what happens and freed animal has to be kept under chains but even this animal can be transfigured deified deified yes in the limbs to divine gambols of love and beauty and bliss like durga uses the lion and kartike the peacock victory who kills the hostile forces in its own right and vishnu garuda and shiva the bull and brahma the swan all of them have some animal or the other which yeah. has been you know deified and transfigured so it's a symbol of eventually the animal in us has to be ennobled purified refined transfigured deified eventually through service obedience of the divine last few lines on a radiant soil that gazed at heaven's smile a swift life impulse stinted not nor stopped these are problem that life impulse gets stinted limited yeah yeah it's like a captive something which neither stinted nor stopped it knew not how to tire happy where it steers such was life in those highest realms there work was play and play the only work <laughs> work was play and play the only work there are people who have been given this kind of you know work in the ashram context even now what is their work sports ground they are in the sports ground either they are teaching or playing <laughs> but here all work everything was play because you know there was such a joy in that service of the divine and it would never tire this is another sign that we are open to the divine in works not only the joy and love but it doesn't tire us if one is doing work in the right spirit it will never tire because the divine keeps pouring more and more energy in fact it increases the vessels capacity receptivity and everything one doesn't feel one is working others may feel oh it's so much work but it's a joy because it's it's like play of the divine service of the divine 
their work was play and play the only work the tasks of heaven a game of god like might a celestial bacchanal for ever pure unstayed by faintness as in mortal frames bacchanal last two lines we read but just the bacchanal yeah. again we have in the word of course comes from the greek bacchus you know it was a whole cult where they believed in wildly being drunk and enjoying of course it was the drunk with the lord's wine shubindu says my words are drunk with the immortal wine then it degenerated like the tantrics it was a path of tantra bacchus and dionysians so bacchanal is those they were rites where they would all get drunk and we have the description of this exactly in shiva's story so there are days when shiva takes the bhang and he gets drunk and everybody is dancing getting drunk and very difficult for someone who is not deep into spiritual lore and understanding that what what kind of a image is this god is getting drunk and jumping around and everybody is drunk and dancing because moralists and puritans are shocked <laughs> but god is of course transmor <laughs> it's not drinking in that sense but it's the wine of ecstasy flowing into the limbs so it's another kind of bacchanal beautiful and they are wild with the delight but even in that wildness there is beauty and order and rhythm and harmony yes it's another kind of riot of ecstasy and it was not making them unconscious unstayed by faintness mm. they were growing with that touch growing into joy growing into wisdom growing into strength the rishis prayed for this wine to make them strong this wine i don't know whether it makes people strong or not what you know i think it is not good in general so you know people shouldn't <laughs> shouldn't know we are not recommending <laughs> drinking as a way of life <laughs> advisory <laughs> advisory <laughs> cautionary note statutory <laughs> warning <laughs> it's about the spiritual wine so when people come to pondicherry they ask sometimes that what is there in pondicherry so i tell them that you know there are two things in pondicherry <laughs> one is wine the other is divine <laughs> so and both are of the highest quality it's up to you what you choose <laughs> my recommendation stay away from the former and connect to the latter but it's up to you because if you connect to the latter you will get both but if you connect to the former you will end up losing both the taste of wine as well as the contact with the divine but if you connect with the divine wine is inbuilt in it so you will get the ecstasy of the divine the supreme yes. wine and these last two lines with yes. which we will close life was an eternity of rapturous moods age never came care never lined the face